right now, so what's going on? All right, here we go. Uh, all right, you, are you guys, are we good guys? Roughly? You think so? Awesome, that's the best tech team ever. Okay, thank you guys for working that out. Here we go, clock and all that kind of stuff. All right, I want to welcome you to our, I want to welcome you to this church that is doing the most amazing thing ever, which is we are going to the Lord and saying, Lord, we really do want to be empowered by you. We want to do the same things. We want to be the same kind of Christians that the ones in the Bible are. <laughs> right? Not sort of things dribbling out and losing, having a form of godliness, but losing its power. We really do want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that God can do what he wants to do, not just what he wants to do, but what he only can do through us. That's what empowered means, the Holy Spirit coming upon and God, who is the Holy Spirit, being able to do what he wants in the way that only he can do it so that it makes the difference that he wants to make in somebody else's life, right? I mean, that's what we're doing. This is the coolest thing. And in order to do that, what we're doing, what we did a couple of weeks ago is we sat down and we said, do we really want to go on this journey? And people said yes. They, took, they prayed and said yes. So we're going on the journey. Last week, we looked at an impediment to moving in that fullness, sin. And we came up and we, we put our sins in a thing and we did like they did in the Old Testament. We took it outside the camp and we burned it up. It was quite a moving moment, actually. I probably should have invited more people out to the fire because it was really kind of cool just to see all of these people saying, I'm not going to let this stop me anymore. You know, I am going to understand what coming under his blood means and so on. Well, this year we're still in that, or this week, we're still in that same basic idea, which is what are things that hinder us from really moving the way that people in the New Testament do? Now, when I say that, I, I just, I just want to say, if I look at the people in the New Testament, obviously there are, are historical and cultural differences, right? I mean, they lived a long time ago, so they, they ate differently and they dressed differently and they, they, you know, there was a difference because of history. There's also a difference because of culture, right? One of the most amazing things about Christianity is, is that you will find people from every culture and every time every time and age since Christ came, that when they talk, look, we get the details of any one person's story are as varied as are our fingerprints, right? There's 360 degrees of ways that people come to God. But when you hear their journey, the interesting thing about Christians, whether you hear the journey from somebody halfway across the world in a totally different culture, or whether you hear the testimony of somebody who wrote 2,000 years ago, what you hear is, that they're going to the same person, right? You hear them talk about what their journey is, and it's different in its, in its detail, but its heart and its spirit are, you know the same God that I've come to know. And this is what is uniting about Christians throughout time and throughout culture. And it's, that's somewhat unique, too, particularly as culture continues to change and so on, you get all of the details continually changing. You get religions that try and lock down those kinds of changes. But, but Christianity is very much moving in the, in the world in the most modern ways and in the most ancient ways. And all at once again, it's surrounded about, it's, it's about one person who we are coming to know. And so there's that commonality and that familiarity. So when I look at the people in the New Testament, I see differences in culture and time, but I see the same story. I see the same person, except in one degree, which is really breaks out into two things, but it's really one thing. And that is this. First of all, they are a lot more committed to mission than we are. <laughs> I don't mean missionary. I mean they're a lot more committed to bringing the good news to people. The average American Christian will bring, only one in ten will bring one person in their lifetime. One in ten Christians, nine Christians will never bring another person to the Lord. One in ten will successfully bring, in their lifetime, one other person. <laughs> now, there's a few that bring a lot more than that. We look at these Christians in the New Testament, and we say, well, geez, man. You know, they had jobs. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were, uh, uh, you know what, tent makers and so on. They had jobs. But yet, they were all about bringing this incredibly good news of Jesus. So they were on mission all the time right? Now, the second thing, and that's why I say it's totally related, is as they were doing that, 
there was just a lot more that God was doing through them, which is to say a lot more miracles and healings and, and not just those kinds of things, words of wisdom and knowledge and pro prophetic, but all kinds of things. There was a lot more of God moving through them. And I have to say, I take those two things, right? That they were a lot more on mission, that God was moving through them a lot more. And I have to say, doesn't that sound like one thing to you? <laughs> right? They were a lot more on mission, so God was moving through them more so that they could accomplish what it was they were trying to do. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see why there is this difference between the way we're living our lives. What is that difference? What are we doing that's causing us to be in this different place? And how can we get it to where we start to move to something that is more what God would have us to be to do and how he'd have us to be and do it? Okay? So the person who's praying for us today is John Woodbury. This is phenomenal. John, uh, amongst many other things, uh, John does a prison ministry that is just so cool. And, and I hate to steal your thunder on that, John, but, or, or take away your rewards in heaven for it. But it's just so wonderful. This is a great man. Get to know him. So, John, please pray for the sermon and lift up another church. Lord Jesus, you told us when you were on the earth that when we pray, we should ask among other things, that your kingdom, your will, would be done in earth as it is in heaven. So my prayer today is that your kingdom would come with all the empowerment you need to use through us to make this life on this earth as close as it can be as it is in heaven. Amen. I lift up uh, Woodenville Methodist Church. Amen sponsor of our prison ministry at uh, Monroe Special Offender Unit. And I know that uh, having attended there before, that they lift up the good news Amen. that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And I pray that that news would go forth this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. It is good to partner so strongly with so many other churches. I love how this church does that. Okay. Hold your breath, Crusher. You know, be praying right now, okay? I hope this works. I told you for a while that the graphics are coming. So the graphics have come for the empowered thing. It's the perfect day to do them. And, okay, that was my fault. Let's hope that this, ah, it's going to work. Josh Morris and Adam Lebonsky are the coolest people in the history of the world. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I'm sorry, I just got to do it again. I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit here, but I'm going to try it again. Okay, just pray that it works again. This is where we were running into our problem earlier. All right, it's still going to work. That's awesome. But isn't that just cool? Now, I hope, you, I hope you immediately get what this is from. Oh, by the way, those are Lake Sammers in those images right there. Uh, so you can, you can kind of, at some point in time, you can look at that and try and figure out who's who. A couple of them are pretty obvious. Okay. Uh, all right. So you see how those, the, the, the tongues of fire, so to speak, are, are resting on each one. This is that Pentecost moment, right? Now, let's just get to that Pentecost moment. But for our sermon today, we do need to learn that we're going to go over fairly quickly. But we need to see this repeatedly because it's very important. The first thing is this. This idea that God empowers people is not new to the New Testament. This has been going on throughout the whole of Scripture. The, at the very beginning, we've got Moses, who is empowered by the Spirit to lead God's people, the Israelites. So much so that at one point in time, he just can't do it anymore. He's getting exhausted. Get, you know, he gets some good advice from his father-in-law. It's awesome. Then I will come down and speak with you there. I will take of the Spirit who's upon you, Moses, and I will put him, the Holy Spirit, upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not bear it alone. See that? This empowering was happening so that they could rightly help the people that were. See that? That's what this is about. A, a really cool one in the Old Testament, we're not going to do a bunch of them, but one more, is Bezalel. And the reason why this is cool, Bezalel is an artist. And God has said, build me a tabernacle. And it's very important for us to note that God gave Moses all the instructions about this tabernacle to the point that you would have thought Moses himself could have gone out there and built it with his own two hands. Or at the very least, overseen the project as there are the different layers and the different things and everything else. But here's the point, remember? 
The point is, God says about this tabernacle, this is going to be the place where I quote-unquote reside. He can never be captured in a tent. But he's going to demonstrate to the Israelites that he's with them as they're being delivered from Egypt and taken into the promised land by being a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud by night. And it's going to be right over the holy place, which is towards the back of this tabernacle. But the point is, everything about this tabernacle, its materials, its colors, the way that it's constructed, everything about this is communicating something about God. So it has to be built, not the way you and I might build something. You know, I mean, we get the instructions from, you know, Tycho or whatever, and we start putting the bike together, right? And, you know, there's a bolt or two left over, and we're like, well, no problem, it's working, you know, and hope the kid doesn't fall off, okay? But bottom line is, what God was saying about this was no. In order to get even something as simple as putting together something when you have all the instructions, in order to do that the way I actually am asking you to do it, it takes me doing something else, which is the Lord has specifically chosen Bezalel of the tribe of Judah. The Lord has filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. You see it? So this empowerment thing is not anything new. What's new to the New Testament is who's being empowered. In the Old Testament, it's Adam and Eve's descendants. In the New Testament, the people that are being empowered, for the most part, there still would be people that would, still would be non-Christians who God could empower. He can do the, anything that he wants to do, right? The empowerment is distinct. But in the New Testament, the ones that he's empowering, the one that we're talking about is, he has taken people and the Holy Spirit has come into them and made them new beings, new creatures. And that's who he's then empowering. So the Holy Spirit comes inside and makes us new, and then there's an empowerment. We see this first and foremost with the first one like this, who's Jesus, right? At his birth, before his birth, even the, the, the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And Jesus is no longer born in the same way that everybody else has been born before him, right? He's not a, he's not a, a um, biological descendant of Adam and Eve. There is a descendancy of human nature that comes through Mary, but the other part is the Spirit of God. So he is born of the Spirit. Later to be, for us to be called born again right? But the bottom line is he's born of the Holy Spirit. And then here's what's really important to note. He's got the Holy Spirit inside of him up until what? You know, 30 years old. He still has it then even. But he goes for 30 years and doesn't do any ministry until what happens? John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. This is what is as Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. The Holy Spirit comes and resides. That was a thing God said to look for and John's saying this is it. So now we see that Jesus is empowered. He's been born of the Spirit. Now he's empowered. Now he's doing the things that he's doing. And always remember this. Jesus did not do the miracles that he did because he was God. He would emptied himself of his godliness and his attributes in that way. And instead he walked as a human being empowered by the Spirit to show us what life can really be like. And so sure enough, we get the same exact pattern in the disciples. Jesus goes to the cross. On the cross, he has, he has taken upon himself, we say, our sin. By which we mean this. We have made choices to go a direction differently than God. And what, what Jesus has done is, he has taken the consequences of the decisions, the, the separation from God, Jesus has taken upon himself, and he has paid for it in full by dying. The grave could not hold him, though, because it wasn't his sin. So he rises again. And then he comes into the upper room. In the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples are gathered together. The doors are locked because they're afraid. Okay? They're, they just killed Jesus. They're next. Then Jesus came, stood amongst them, and said, Peace to you. That means don't be afraid anymore. But then he does this. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. This peace is this reconciliation with God. And here's how it's happening. As the Father sent me, I send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The same God who formed a lump of clay way back in the very beginning and breathed on it and made it, made it a body with a spiritual being in it, with a spiritual essence, that same God 
who overshadowed Mary and created in her a new kind of person has now come along, has now come to the disciples who have been forgiven their sin by his death and are now made new by his spirit. So they're born again, right? But you would think now that they're born again, they got the Holy Spirit inside. Who's the Holy Spirit? You know, like the one who hovered over everything and like gave it shape and meaning and you know, like creator. So you would think having the Holy Spirit inside, go for it, right? Go out there and minister and do whatever, you know, I mean, God's in you, you're gonna do great. But instead what Jesus tells them after 40 days of being with them after his resurrection, while he was still with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. See, he's telling people that have already been born again, wait until you're empowered so that when the Holy Spirit moves through you and you minister, it's not you. Can I say something? I don't think it's horrible that we would want to go out and do these things on our own. God has touched us, done wonderful things in us. It's a great story. It's a great testimony. Tell it. But if you really want to get him saved, actually let the Lord tell it through you. <laughs> let the Lord do it his way. So that it doesn't just look like a tent. It is actually the tabernacle made after the pattern that God intended. Are we catching this? I mean, it's not that complicated, but we need to cover this because of where we're going today. Okay, so there we go, and of course what happens 10 days later? The day of Pentecost had fully arrived, they're all together in one place, suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind comes from heaven, it fills the whole house where they're staying, tongues like flames of fire are divided, appear to them, and rest on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's what this image is to communicate to us. So we're going to be using this for a long time, and whenever you see that, I want you to remember what this is about, Okay? God empowering us so that he can do his will, his way through us. Okay? Now, having said that, we're returning to our main question for the day. And our main question for the day is, how come our lives look so different in these two regards, particularly in God moving and empowerment through us? How come our, don't we see and don't we minister in the same way that they did? What's the difference? Now, the first thing that we want to note is we're in Luke, and we, we're in this passage where Zechariah, he's, he's ministering in the temple. The angel comes to him. He says, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son. You're to name him John. We've already looked at this. You'll have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. He's going to be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. Now listen, verse 16. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. What's he doing? He's turning hearts to God. When we're going out and ministering to people, what are we trying to do? Turn hearts to God. Okay? So, he will turn many Israelites to the Lord of God. He'll be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. In that, he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. See, the Lord wants to come. They need to be prepared so that they will receive, so that they will accept what, Lord has, what the Lord has done. So here we go. Okay? He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He'll turn the hearts of the Father to their children. He'll cause the rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. If you want to know more about that passage, listen to last week. Watch it online. Okay? Bottom line, what we're looking at this week is the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, what does this refer to? What's the spirit of Elijah? Repentance. But there's also a power. Let's take the first one first. The spirit of Elijah. What is John doing? He's calling people to repentance. What does Elijah do? Elijah lives in a time about 800 years before Jesus. And what is going on is the tribes have separated. Two tribes are still following God and they've gone south. Or they just stay south. And ten tribes in the north become what we now call Israel. And these kings are all bad. And you can understand why. The southern kings are worshiping God. The northern kings are pretty freaked out. Their people are going to start worshiping God and rebel against them. So they're leading these people purposefully to other gods. They're leading them astray. See that? Now it gets to its probably pinnacle in Ahab and the wonderful Jezebel. Right? Everybody knows what a Jezebel means, I hope. You know? It's just, wow. <laughs> 
You know, it's like big problems, big issues, okay, rebellious, the whole nine yards. In fact, Jezebel is, not she's not whatsoever, she is the daughter of a foreign king who is married to Ahab, and she is Jezebel. She wants them to follow the god Baal, which we just call Bell because, I mean, English people get to pronounce words any way they want because everybody speaks our language, then they have to speak it the way we do, okay? <laughs> so Jezebel, Jezebel, Baal, Bell, her name is priest of Baal. That's what she is. So she's leading Israel to do these priests of Baal, and Elijah comes and he says, you know, there's a real God, <laughs> and you guys are just getting impossibly far from him, and so here's what I'm going to do. You bring 450 of your prophets up to Mount Carmel. You let them build an altar. We'll put a dead animal. We'll sacrifice an animal on it, and we'll see if your God comes and consumes that sacrifice. Because you sacrifice animals, so you think that God's getting something. So if he's real, you'd think he'd show up and consume the sacrifice. So you do that, and then I'll do the same thing, and we'll see whose God is really real. This is a, this is a test. This is a thing that, that, that Elijah is counting on God to reveal himself as true and real. By the leading of God, by the way. God's the one who told him to do it. He didn't just make it up. That would be one of the reasons why we have some problems with some of the things we want to have happen, happen. Because we thought they were a good idea, and then we really want God to do what we thought was a good idea. And let me just say clearly, you'll hear this for two years, just incessantly, it's a much better idea to find out what God actually wants to do, and then you're much more likely to have success in what you're doing. Okay? Having said that, in the spirit and power of Elijah, so what happens is they build their thing, and so we get to, uh, they've, been, they've been, all morning long, they've been chanting and praying and being in trances and cutting themselves and doing all this. I love Elijah. About noontime, Elijah begins mocking him. You'll have to shout a little louder. He scoffed. Surely he's God. Maybe he's daydreaming. Maybe he's relieving himself. You know what that means? <laughs> Maybe he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just got to call him back. Okay? Maybe he went away on a trip. You know, or he's asleep and he needs to be wakened. So the whole morning goes by, nothing happens. Elijah says, okay, my turn. He builds an altar. He tells people, go fill jugs of water and douse this thing. In fact, douse it three times so fully that he has to build a trench around it to hold all the water. What he's saying is, we're, you're not going to have any excuse. It's not going to be a little tender. You know, it was kind of a hot day. And I mean, after all, we were in the morning when there was dew and you were in the afternoon when it was dry and hot or something stupid, right? He douses it in water. And then he cries out to the Lord to show. And sure enough, immediately the fire of God fell and burned up the offering, the wood, the stones, the dirt, even the water in the trench. And the people saw it happen and fell on their faces in awed worship, exclaiming, God's the true God, God's the true God. You see how he's turning the hearts of the people back to the Lord? God's, oh, <laughs> now we know who's real, Right? Now, here's the key to this. The spirit is to repentance, to prepare for the Lord to come. Right? Now, they, um, they didn't actually get it very right, but it wasn't, you know, they had every reason to get it right, and they just still didn't in the end. And, and within a very short period of time, they're gone. There is no more ten tribes. There is no more nation of Israel. In the, ten, in the northern tribes, they're all gone. Okay? So... Not yet. <laughs> Pay attention, right? Now, what happens is, though, okay, in the New Testament, this same pattern continues, right? Paul does miracles. Peter does miracles. John does miracles. Stephen does miracles. Philip does miracles. There's all kinds of people all the way throughout that are doing miracles. And what we say is this, signs and wonders accompanied the coming of the gospel. In other words, to prepare people's heart, there was some evidence that God was real so that people had some reason to say there might be a difference between this God and my God because my God I made with my own hands and this God seems to be making things with his hands. So that's cooler, right? Got to pick one, the one that you made with your own hands or the one that makes stuff. Let's go with the one that makes stuff, the one that does things. And so what we get is, is we get sp things like this, 1 Corinthians. My speech and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of man's wisdom, but with a powerful demonstration by the Spirit. How about this one? For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power, 
The Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. He's not saying that proclaiming the gospel in words is bad. He's saying, back it up. <laughs> right? He's saying, God wants to back it up. Now, we're getting into some areas here that we've been talking about for weeks about proof and so on and this tricky little dynamic of proof but just hang on to it for a sec what i really want us to hear right now is i don't want us to have the filters on that always filter away what the truth of the word is because the truth of the word is is that the kingdom of god is not a matter of talk but power now we're not talking oppressive domineering power we're not talking a manly worldly kingly type of power we're talking an evidence we're talking God moving in a way that demonstrates that he's actually real. That's what he means by power. See? Now let me just ask you something. When you're trying to lead somebody to the Lord, what do you do? What do we do? We go and we talk to them. <laughs> Don't we? Isn't that what we think we're supposed to do? We go and we talk to them. Now I want to say there's nothing wrong with talking to them. Right? But I want to say something else. What if we were really praying and asking the Lord, what is it this person needs? What is it that's going on in this person's life? What if we actually like really prayed for a person before we went and talked to them? <laughs> when we were praying, we were actually expecting God maybe to like help us out. <laughs> what if there was an expectation that God actually wants to save them more than we do and is willing to step up to help do so? Because that's what's being said here. He's willing. He will. And that's what we see in the New Testament. Now, a little sidebar here. Note something. John the Baptist, of all the people, said to be the greatest prophet of all. He didn't do any miracles. So John the Baptist didn't do miracles? He did. You know the miracle that he did? Or the, or the preparing that he did, he brought the way. If John had done miracles, John the, John the gospel writer is the one that tells us this. If John had done miracles, the problem would have been that there would have been an even bigger debate between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. What John did was, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. I'm not going to do any of that. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to prepare your way in repentance, and then the one who really does all of this other dimensional stuff is going to come and do it. He's going to show us that the kingdom is indeed at hand, right here right now, in operation. So John's the one who brings in the guy who brings it all in. <laughs> who brings the kingdom of God into this earth in a way that is demonstrably different from anything that had happened before. Much, much, much more so. All right. So with that, okay, where we are is we see that God wants to bring people. There is a signs and wonders aspect to it. Now, now, let me say really carefully, really clearly, anybody who's been around here for a long time knows this. I am really abhorrent to the circus and the perversion that takes place when people start to try and move in the Holy Spirit. There is a deception that comes. If Satan cannot keep you in the ditch of inactivity, he will try to get you into the ditch of hyperactivity. Either way, you won't be on the high road that is Christ. Okay? So there's a lot of perversions that have taken us, taken people and said, that's kooky, that's weird, I'm not going to do it. Let me say something. If we're not doing it like Jesus, we're not doing it right. And what Jesus did was not kooky or weird. It was incredibly attractive. Why? Because it wasn't about themselves and it wasn't about the show. And this is Corinthians now. We've been saying this is a mashup of Luke and Corinthians. Luke is the Holy Spirit done right. Corinthians is the Holy Spirit done wrong. In Corinthians, what the people did wrong was they were bringing glory to themselves. It was about themselves. In Luke, it was about other people. So that orientation to other people is what keeps it real because if somebody's sick and dying and they get healed, they don't think that's kooky. And neither does anybody else. <laughs> if somebody wants to do a circus thing, that's kooky. So we're not doing circus things. What we're doing is what Jesus did. He's our guide. He's our model. That's what we're going to do, right? So with that in mind now, I need to take you on a little, little, it's not really a side path, but I need to take you down a little tributary of this river because I need you to see something about one of the reasons why we are not moving in it like they did that is actually true. We really are not moving like this, and we will never in this regard. Okay? Watch this. There is always in the Lord a movement from touch to faith. 
We've looked at it before and say healing. When Jesus first heals Peter's mom, right, at the very beginning of everything, they don't know that he can heal. So there's no faith involved. He just touches him and she gets healed. And they're going, oh, he heals people. And then for the rest of the time, Jesus is working out with them in ever deeper ways about healing. Our The Journey class, we, we did some notes and we've been looking at this stuff. The Journey class has been a blast. I mean, God's just showing up. And we looked at all of these healing things, and we looked and saw how much Jesus was pushing faith more and more and more. He was trying to get people to believe and take them out of the manifestation, the sign, and take them into the reality, the person. Okay? So having said that, there's this journey in all the time in God from touch to faith. He's got to show us what it looks like, and then he wants us to start believing for it. So, in the things of the Holy Spirit, we see this exact pattern in Acts. Because after all, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. A sound like a violent rushing wind comes from heaven, fills the whole house where they're staying. Tongues like flames of fire divided appear on them and rest on each one of them. Now, how much faith did it take for them to have that happen to them? Right? I mean, they're just sitting there praying. They didn't know to expect any of this. Right? And all of a sudden, big sound, oh my gosh, what is that? And then fire coming on them and the whole thing. This is God doing this. A big neon billboard going, bing, bing, bing. God sitting over there, he's going, look over here, look over here. Something new is happening. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this gets their attention, right? So what God is doing is, is he's saying, look, when the first time I do something, I've got to do something so that you know that this is something. Because actually what's going on is in the spirit, and it's not nearly as visible. It actually has more effect. The, the signs go away. In fact, let me ask you this question. So God comes and baptizes people with this rushing mighty wind and fire. So now, since we're learning from the Bible, the way everybody gets baptized in the spirit is how? A violent rushing mighty wind and fire. And so people in Jerusalem, I mean, this is the story, right? They're in Jerusalem, and they're just, you know, having lunch, and all of a sudden a violent rushing wind comes, and fire hits them, and bam, they're, right? We never hear this happen ever again, ever again. One time, point out something brand new happened. It never happens again. Because he's trying to get us to understand what it was about. Just that it really is him, but now what's it really about? Now watch this. They go, just in, a, in, just in a few chapters, the gospel's starting to spread like Jesus said it was. It's gone from J Jerusalem to Judea, now it's gone to Samaria, which is still pretty close to Israel and all that, right? And so the point is some Israelites, some Jewish believers in Samaria are starting to believe, and now watch this. As they arrive, they play, pray for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, for they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? They were saved. Baptized in Jesus, the Holy Spirit had come and made them new. They were Christians. And then, like the same pattern we saw with Jesus, the same pattern we saw with the disciples, then Peter and John ask for fire and wind to come. No, they laid hands on them and prayed for the Holy Spirit to come. Now, watch. Does it take more faith to ask somebody to lay hands on you or just be standing there and have a wind and fire come? Which takes more faith? If you're going to ask somebody, you know, they're going to say, we're going to lay hands on you to receive the Holy Spirit. You've got to say yes to that. <laughs> you know, these are new believers. They're excited. They're not struggling with this, and they're not asking, and this is key, they're not asking for proof. They're not saying, I won't really believe that God does miracles until I stick my finger in his side and, you know, finger in his hand and hand in his side. See, the doubting Thomas thing. They're not asking for proof. They're just excited. God has done something wonderful in their hearts, and they're like, let's go. <laughs> so they say, hey, the Holy Spirit will empower you and help you. Great, lay hands on me. <laughs> but it is more faith than just standing there and having it happen to you. Same thing happens when the baptism of the Holy Spirit goes to, or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit goes to, those are synonyms, goes to the Gentiles. Jewish people, let's make it clear, Jewish people in that day and age are not supposed to hang out with Gentiles. Gentiles are unclean and they will make them unclean. So Peter is hanging out up on the roof one day and he has this dream and three times this sheet filled with unclean animals drops down and, and God says, eat. And he says, I know better than this. 
I've never eaten any of that unclean stuff. And God says, well, I've called clean. Stop calling unclean. Take and eat. And then he sa- after the third one, he says, and oh, by the way, there's a couple of Gentiles downstairs. Go with them. <laughs> so he goes to this righteous man's house. He starts to preach. Notice where this all happens now. He, this is his sermon. There's 42 other verses that come before this about a sermon. I'm not doing that sermon. All the prophets testify, him, says Peter to them, that through his name, Jesus' name, everyone who believes in Jesus will receive forgiveness of sins. Where are they in the message? If you're listening to this intently, God has told you to listen to this guy, and you're listening to it intently. This is the moment at which you're going, Jesus forgives my sins. I want Jesus. <laughs> so right then they're getting saved. And then what happens next? The Holy Spirit comes down on all those who heard the message. Now when it says comes down, it's not saying the Holy Spirit comes in and makes them new. It's the same thing that happened in the Pentecost minus the wind and the, and the fire. That's what Peter says about it. He goes back later and he says, what was I supposed to do? You know, same thing happened to them, happened to us. Right, watch that right there. See, the sign was not only, the, the move was not only for the Gentiles to know God was doing something, it was for the Jews to know that God was doing something in the Gentiles. See that? So he's got a touch. So they can get people outside their boxes. But now that he's got them outside their boxes, here goes Paul off on his missionary journey. He's going now to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. He's all the way over here at Ephesus. This isn't actually the journey that we're on, the one that we're talking about right now, but this is another one. But anyway, he gets all the way over here to Ephesus, and here's what happens. Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe he asked him? Now notice this, okay? No, they replied, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> then what baptism did you experience? And they replied, the baptism of John. That's just repentance. So Paul says, John baptism is a call repentance from sin. John himself told people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, which means what? They were saved. The Holy Spirit came in, made them new. Then what happened? Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. No, I mean, these are new Gentiles. This isn't a new area. This is somewhere out there. Why didn't God go ahead and do the touch thing again? Why didn't he? Why is he moving at all, all this, you know, even that close? They are so far away. Why is he doing that? Now follow this concept. Because there's an accountability. God is trying to move us to a place of faith. And there's an accountability that they have. We're going to see this in one second, but let me tell you a little story first. This whole movement from touch to faith is really keen to me because God moved me through this. In 1983, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, empowered by His Spirit, and you know me, wallflower that I am, I just kept it to myself and didn't tell anybody about it. <laughs> so instead, I got kind of excited. I've never been excited before, but I did this time. And I went out and started praying for people. People that I'd ask them if they want this, and they'd say yes, and I'd pray for them. And I prayed for well over 100 people in seven-year period of time, a little over seven years. And, and now listen to this. Every time I prayed for somebody, the interesting thing was, is that when I prayed for them, I would feel what they were feeling in their own bodies. And I would say, did you feel that little tingling? And I'm very specific. This isn't like horoscope stuff. Very specific. Did you feel that whatever it was? Very different things all the time. It wasn't the same pattern whatsoever. But did you feel that? That's the Holy Spirit coming. Just say yes. Just give yourself, give yourself over to him. Let him come. Say Yes. And I would help people get to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that way. And all but two, as I talked about last week, did in fact come, right? And get filled and empowered to this day, as far as I know, still walking in it, right? But a little after 1990, all of a sudden, I was praying for people, still praying for people, just kept praying all the way through. But about 1990, I started praying for people, and I didn't have that experience anymore. I didn't feel anything anymore. I didn't like that. People were still getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I didn't like it. And I didn't understand why God was doing that, because the other way seemed so helpful. And so I started pressing into him. Now, here's the key to this story. I pressed into him for two years. 
Can I just ask, being totally honest, how many things have you ever pressed into God for for two years? Anything. I mean, if you're like sick or if you're like really poor or something, you got over two years in you, right? But other than that, probably not. And certainly this wasn't about me whatsoever. This was about why aren't you doing it the same way that you were doing it before? That's the only question I was asking. They were still getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. But I was asking him, why aren't you doing it like you did it before? And for two years, I asked him and I pressed him and I knocked and I sought and I asked and I knocked and I sought and I asked and I sought and I knocked. And I kept doing that until finally, after about two years, the Lord said to me, I want you to think about this. In 1960, the baptism of the Holy Spirit starts really coming in earnest. One of the, well, this, this region of the country is phenomenally blessed because Dennis Bennett was down in Van Nuys, California. Episcopal priest said that he'd been empowered by the Holy Spirit, so they kicked him out. They sent him up here, praise God. Many people sitting in this room had the privilege of being around Dennis Bennett and that church when they were going, you know, several people in here, and I'm looking and seeing some of the eyes. And there was all kinds of stuff that came out of that. Good, very good things. Full gospel businessmen, women's aglow, many, many, many other things, okay? So praise God for the Northwest. Now, but the point is, is he said, look, Kurt, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, if you got filled with the Holy Spirit and you were on staff at a church, you got fired. I mean, I mean, literally, the stories were, you know, I had this experience with the Holy Spirit before you could finish the sentence. The lead pastor would say, how fast can you clean up your desk and be out of this building? Churches were splitting over this. People were losing their jobs. You had to make a choice. Are you going to go with God or not? Are you going to go with church and a job, right? I mean, this was pastors in America that were preaching that this stuff we're talking about was of the devil. That's what was going on in those decades. This was something where when God would do this to somebody and touch them, it was kind of nice to have in the middle of the persecution, in the middle of the stuff that was happening to you, that was coming against you about all of this because it was still the margins. It was nice to have a little moment where you could say, you know, I know. See? But then about 1990, about halfway through 1990 into 91, 92, it all started to flip, didn't it? Now all of a sudden you have Baptist churches that still preach dispensationalism, which simply means that the gifts have ended. There's other things it means, but for our purposes today, it just means that the gifts have ended. God doesn't do that anymore. And all of a sudden in 1991, 92, and so on, Baptist churches started praying for people's healings. They would preach dispensationalism, but they would pray for healing. <laughs> there was a kind of worship that came into the church that was filled with God's presence and his power. And it became normative throughout the whole church. All of a sudden, you didn't lose a job if you got empowered with the Spirit. In fact, you might have got one because you were. <laughs> see, the thing flipped. And what God said to me was, is, see, it's gone from touch, and now I need it to be faith. Because if I keep it at touch, then people are going to try to build their faith on a manifestation, and that is not me. Elijah had this incredible moment where he goes off to the cave after he kills those 450 because he's afraid. And what happens is, is God brings this great wind and it smashes walks. Then he brings this great fire and he brings this great earthquake. And what it says every time, very interesting, God was not in any of those. He brought them, but he was not in them. What was he in? Then a still small voice said, Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> you just killed 450 prophets. You did good. Why are you running away? Right? The person of God, the person of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit. When that happened, God said, I'm not going to touch anymore. And so I did something. I don't know if I did this right or not. You'll have to tell me. There's several people that have been baptized this way or been empowered this way. So, you know, tell people it does still work. But I actually took this and I went, you know what, God? Kind of like, you know, the one guy who said, he said, Jesus come, or they said, you got to come. And he said, I'll come to your house. Said, oh, no, I'm not worthy of being in my house. You just tell them and they'll do what they do and all that kind of stuff. You remember that story? Well, in that same vein, what I started doing is I started saying, you know, when I, when, even when I pray and lay hands on people, they still think that it's somehow me doing something. Since it's faith, since what you really want to build it on is faith, since, and now listen carefully here, because I'm into some heavy-duty charismatic theology right now, and I can stand on this, and I, I don't know that I would die at it, but boy, somebody would really have to convince me where I was wrong before I'd come off of it. 
Okay? I think that there's a whole lot of people that are moving in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and don't even get it. Don't even know that. I think there's Baptist preachers that have preached against it for years and are moving in it. I think there's people that have been prayed around in circles and they can't figure out why they didn't get it. And the truth is they got it. They're just looking for something else. The fact is, is I think there's a whole lot of people that have asked God at some time, God help me minister. And when you say, God help me minister, what does God do? Why he helps you minister. See, I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking, the door will be open. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. You've heard that, right? And that's about, you know, the financial need that you've got or the, you know, the healing that you need or whatever, right? That's what that's about, right? But it isn't about that at all, is it? Look, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? If they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And, and he's not talking here about the Holy Spirit in salvation. He's talking about how much more will he give if you ask him to move through. Uh, John Wimber did this in the best way. John Wimber used to ask people, do you want to be prayed for to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And to a man, they all said no. So he finally went, you know, I give. Do you want to be, do you want to be prayed for to be empowered in your ministry? Yes. <laughs> it's the same thing. But he just said, who cares about the language? The language actually becomes important. But let's, let's worry about the language later. Let's get this part right. And so what I started doing with people is this. I started saying, I'm not going to pray for you and lay hands on you. If you really want me to, I will. I don't care. I just want you to get empowered, right? If you need me to do it, fine. But do understand, you're going to have to get me out of the way quick because, you know, I'm not any good. Okay? You really need God. What I started doing was I started saying, on the way home in your car, just ask God to empower you. When you get home, if, you don't want, if that seems too casual to you, that's fine. Go into your closet when you get home and be in some place and pray and ask God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength that you would be empowered. And don't expect anything to happen. Just expect him to do what you asked. And get up from that closet and go try and minister to somebody. And start moving in this. Because this is for all. This is the normal Christian life. It's been perverted and corrupted and Corinthianized in ways that have made it freaky and people have backed off of it. But the fact of the matter is what God wanted, of course Satan tries to pervert that which is actually God. <laughs> right? Should we be surprised about that? Having said that, I'm going to do a quick thing here, okay? I just want to take you down one more thing on this, and then I'm wrapping it up. See, high accountability means you should have known. doesn't mean you do know. It just means there's every reason for you to think that you could have known. Low accountability means there's no, you know, all the, there's a spectrum, right? And it's all the way to somebody who's literally never heard the name of Jesus before, okay? Down here is low faith, and what that means is little or no faith. They, they, they don't believe, when I say faith, I'm not talking about faith in something. I'm talking about faith in the real God who wants to empower you to do his ministry. Okay? So there's people that don't have any of that in them. And then there's high faith, such as to be able to move a mountain, it says, in the word, right? Okay, so now here we go. Which quadrant do you fit in? So here's the first quadrant. Low faith, low accountability. David, you're up. Okay? I want you to meet David, my Muslim friend. Now, he's not actually a Muslim, okay? But I want you to meet David, okay? <laughs> I'm not, he says. Okay, so low faith, low accountability. You, know, you realize in Muslim countries right now, boy, I just cannot get this thing to, to stay still. In Muslim countries, there's a whole lot of them that are closed, and it is illegal to proselytize. It's illegal to talk about Christianity to Muslims. It's not only illegal to just talk about it, it's illegal for the Muslim to convert to Christianity. It's illegal. There are penalties for it. it. It sometimes even comes to death. But it certainly is ostracization from family. It certainly is a whole lot of other things and everything else. It's illegal. So these are closed countries where the only thing they ever hear about God who empowers and Jesus Christ and so on is usually a great deception, a great lie on what is actually true. Right? So... Here's David in a, in, a, in a closed Muslim nation. So he's got low faith, 
you know, he doesn't believe in a God that moves through you. Islam don't, is, Muslim doesn't believe that. Uh, the Islam religion doesn't believe that God does that. That's not how, most religions don't think that. There's only a few that do. Okay? Low accountability, which means there's no way that he could have known. Where was he ever going to hear it? Right? Now, what's the likelihood of him seeing a miracle? Tell me what it is. Is it high or low or medium? And tell me why. Why? Why is it high? Touch is really good. There's, a, there's, a, there's one more way to put it. Touch is exactly right. Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, because God wants to save them. <laughs> you know what I mean? He likes them. He wants to bring them to him. So the probability is very high. In fact, you do know what's going on in Muslim countries right now, right? You do know that what's happening in that 1040 closed window is people by the scores are having visions of Jesus. He's coming to them in dreams and visions and revealing himself to them. And they are, I know one of these people personally. And they are coming to the Lord in the droves. And these people that are seeing these visions are spreading that gospel about Jesus is really real. There is a personal God. He loves us. He's not just the angry one and we get to go to some other heaven and he's really still up here and so on. You know what I mean, there's a personal God who loves you and all this kind of stuff. And they are evangelizing incredibly. In fact, okay, because again, some charismatic media can get a little not very discerning sometimes. Christianity Today, a very scholarly, very academic journal, the kind of place that you would go to get reliable information. Christianity Today and talking about what's happening in the Muslim world. Christianity Today, who fought against the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all that for many, many years. Christianity Today talks about how in the Muslim countries, there's just this phenomena of people having visions of Jesus. So God's trying to touch them, bring them to miracles. So congratulations, you're now a Christian. <laughs> okay, you're next. Come on up, okay? All right, now, high faith, low accountability. What kind of person are we talking about here? There'd be several different examples, but let's say a brand new Christian. Okay, this is awesome, right? Okay, so brand new Christian. High faith, what's a brand new Christian like? This is incredible. I've been made new. I see things differently. This is awesome. I can't wait. This is cool. I can't wait, right? They just want to go, okay? And so what do they do? They go. And what is God like? People who just go, <laughs> okay? So high faith, low accountability. Hasn't really heard much. See what I mean? So what's the likelihood of, of miracles for her? Pretty high, right? Doesn't mean everybody she's talking to, but that's pretty, yeah, way to go, okay? There you go, okay, next. And I need two of you to come, okay? And then just kind of, just be ready. I'll, I'll do it in a second, so don't come just yet, but I, you're going to come in a sec, okay? All right, thank you. These are people from our youth group. Aren't they cool? Okay, all right. All right, now, low faith, high accountability. Who's that? A typical American Christianity. They've been hearing about the Bible for years, and they've got it all figured out some other way than what it actually says. So they have a very high accountability. They should know better. But they got really low faith. You have a form of godliness having denied its power. You have not done that whatsoever. Okay? <laughs> now, what's the likelihood of miracles here? Right, right. So it's low. Now, I want to do something, okay? I'm going to have you sit, and then would you come up? It's not just Christians that fit into this. It's the typical American I want you to just watch this. Now, this is, we're just saying that this is the typical American, doesn't know Jesus. But do think about it. What's the chances of the typical American having had some church experience? Pretty high. Even if they haven't had church experience, what's the, what's the, under, what's the possibility that they've actually had pretty good exposure to the fact that Jesus Christ did miracles, that he lived, that, he's, that he wants to save you, and that God does miracles and stuff like that? Is it, right? It's pretty high, right? So the accountability on the typical American is actually pretty high, isn't it? Okay? Now their faith is low, but the accountability is pretty high. So the chances of this person seeing miracles is low, and I just want to take you here. I want to show you some. See, because here's what we say. We, we say, well, if God would just do a miracle, then my faith would be high. If God would just do something that I could see, it would be high, right? So here we go. Then the rich man says, he goes up to heaven. He says, please, Father Abraham. The rich man goes, and Lazarus is across this great gulf. The rich man is in a place of torment. The Lazarus, the poor man, is in, a, in Abraham's bosom in heaven. He says, please, Father, at least send him to my father's home, for I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so that they don't end up in this place of torment. 
But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man says, no, Father. If someone is sent to them from the dead, then they'll repent of their sins and turn to God. You see the accountability in here? It's not like they didn't have Moses and the prophets. They could have. They should have. See? So they're being held accountable too. But what Jesus does is he takes it all the way. If someone is sent to them from the dead, then they'll repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. See, it's just proving something that you really want to get off of here, don't you? <laughs> okay. So you now believe. Okay. So go ahead. Now I want to say something. And I'm, 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 uh, I want to say something. There's an exception to every rule, right? I think the typical American, particularly if they have some church experience, the chances of God proving something to them are pretty low. But can I just say something? There's a person that I know that I love probably about as much as I love anybody in the world. And, and they, they are very, very genuine. And they're, they're probably one of the nicest, most pure hearts of anybody that I've ever known in my life, honestly. And they're not a Christian. They're just an awesome human being. And, and in a very real way, there is a... There is a an honest skepticism about other people's accounts. I think that, you know, most people will learn from and so on, but there's a reason, there's an empirical thing, and this person in a very genuine way has said, do you think the Lord would mind if I devised a way of just seeing whether or not some improbable things might happen and, and that would help me to believe? And now you could say by the argument that I just made, no, you shouldn't do that because it's about proof and it's building your house on the wrong, it's building your house on sand which is manifestations and proofs which do not do the things that we expect them to do. But can I say something? Go for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I don't think God is offended by somebody coming to him and saying, I'm really trying, honestly. And as far as I can tell where I am right now, here's where I am. And could you please? You see what I'm saying? I mean, if we don't have a graciousness about who God is, we do not know who God is. Okay? So I just want to be careful about that, having said that. Now we got our last one, okay? So come on up, okay? All right? Now we're back to, what did I do? Uh, I may have frozen back there. Okay? There you go, thank you. Uh, hit one more for me. All right. High faith, high accountability. Okay? Who is this person? They're the Lake Sam Christian, <laughs> right? Because everybody here really believes, right? Here's the truth. Two years from now, I think everybody here is going to believe in such a deeper way that can I change it from Lake Sam Christian to this? The person who's pressing in to move an empowerment. High faith, high accountability. What's the chances of them seeing miracles? High. High. What's the chances of them seeing miracles every time like we see in Scripture? Actually low. Even Jesus could only do a few miracles because of their unbelief. We're not the only factor in this equation. You see it? Our faith is not the only thing. Thank you very much for saving so many people. I'm not saying it's low, but here's, here's what I, you get where we're going, what we did with that, right? But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build us to a place where we think differently about these things because here's, and this is, I'm ending right now, here's where the problem is, and this is a big problem. We let our experiences define our beliefs instead of the word, and so we do not experience what the word says is ours. Here's what happens. We go and we pray for somebody, and they don't get healed. And so we start figuring, we start rejiggering our theology to match our experience. I, I believed, I get, but it sure seemed like they believed too. I mean, how many times have you prayed for somebody? And as far as you could tell, they had more faith than you did. And yet you prayed for them, and they didn't get healed. What do you do with that? What we do with it is, is we take that and we degrade our own faith. We degrade our own theology. We make it about God's will that we can never know. We make it about all these other things, all of which has some truth in it, so there's a reason for it. But all of which is, let me put it this way, can we start working on the exceptions after we've got the rule down good? Because we're defining our theology by the exceptions, not by the rule. The rule is the word. 
Can I show you where this really works? Dispensationalism. This is an entire theology that was built on basically this idea. If there's a dispensationalist in here, you're going to hate me right now, but I can, I can demonstrate this. What happens is, after the time of Jesus and the disciples and the apostles, miracles start to dwindle. Now, I would argue that it has something to do with the maturing that we're talking about, and it has to do with a whole lot of other things that we'll talk about in the weeks to come. But the bottom line is, miracles are declining, so here's what we do. We come up with a theology, and here's what the theology says. Oh, God only needed to do miracles until the Bible was written. Now that the Bible's written, we don't need miracles anymore. Which I want to say to them, please speak to my Muslim friend and tell me how that works out for him. Because he's got no Bible. And he's got nobody telling him about that. Please feel free to speak to these people who have not heard. Because I, you know, God loves them and he's trying to get to them somewhere. So if you're saying that God isn't doing things to still bring people to him because after all they have the word, that sounds a little bit to me like Scientology where you've got to sit down and read the books and then you understand how life really is because it's after all about thetans and all that kind of garbage. Are you catching this? Here's the truth about this, the word. This is what it says. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. How to stand right with God, that means. So that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. I love the way the message says it. Every part of scripture is God-breathed. That, word, that thing that we've been talking about. God-breathed and useful. It shows us truth. It exposes our rebellion. It corrects our mistakes. It trains us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. The word is God, just as Jesus is God. Jesus is the incarnation of God, meaning God become flesh, carne asada, that's flesh. Jesus becoming flesh. The word is God come into ink, come into the word. The word is God, living and alive. And it is to come into us, and just as the Holy Spirit does, as he comes in like he did over all of creation, he shapes what's formless and void and turns it into something that has shape and meaning and purpose. The word is to be coming into our hearts and shaping how we think, shaping how we act, shaping how we react. It's supposed to be forming us. It is breathing into us. And it is supposed to be defining us according to its way. But what we're doing instead is, we're defining it. I want to be a people of the word. Does that sound like a good idea? I want to be a people of the word. If God moved in signs and wonders to bring people to him in the past, I know that he wants to do the same now. Yes, we may be in a more mature place. Yes, there may be other things happening. But here's what I want to hold on to. God, <laughs> don't you? I want us to go after this all the way. I want us to understand that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. <laughs> Amen? So Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, your people come before your throne. And what we come before to do is to be shaped by you. What we are going to do this week is we are going to let this seed plant in us and let it agitate us. We're going to take this thought that the Christians of old were somehow really different than us, even though we shouldn't be. And we're going to let that stir something in us to where we start to hunger and thirst, to where we start to desire in fullness, to where we start to go after with everything we've got who you are in fullness and who you want us to be. So in Jesus' holy and precious name, this congregation comes before you and says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Or as I put for this week's title, your kingdom done. Make that be the truth through us. We reach down before and we pick up this communion and we take that lower cup in which is the body of Christ that was broken. And we understand that what that means is, is that we have strayed. We have allowed our theology to become redefined. 
we have allowed ourselves to lose faith. And in Jesus' holy and precious name, it has broken us. So we put our fingers in there and we break that bread and get that nice noise going on in this room to say we get it. We are preparing the way of the Lord by repenting. We are preparing the way of the Lord by expecting you to come and to heal us, to make us whole, to make us in your image, ever more so. Take this cup with me, would you please? And now in Jesus' most magnificent and glorious name, we lift up this cup in which is the blood that was shed for us. And at the moment that that blood was shed, everything that we would ever need has been given to us. We don't live in it, but it's there. And so we come right now and we say, Lord God, cause us to recognize what you've already done. Cause us to walk in what you've already 